A priest friend of mine encountered something very curious in his first year as a priest. As he was teaching the children who were preparing for First Holy Communion. That's not usually a difficult crowd. Few objections are raised at that age, and unlike catechesis for adults, a young priest feels pretty confident that he can handle the field of questions that are to come from a seven-year-old. Yet, on this occasion, the unexpected happened. One of the children was adamant that he did not believe in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. What seemed at first just a precocious defiance turned into a manifestation of genuine disbelief. Not only did this child disbelieve, he wanted others to disbelieve as well. My friend's theological training came to the ready, and he quickly thought of answers, scripturally, metaphysically, historically, liturgically, but that didn't seem to be quite appropriate for a seven-year-old child. Arguments were not the issue. There happened to be something missing, something odd. He called me about the case and we discussed it and concluded the child simply did not have the gift of faith. The question is why? Why was he denied? He mentioned the case to his pastor. The elder man said, check and make sure that he was baptized. As it turned out, the child had not been baptized. But after some preparation, he was. And what do you suppose happened? You guessed it. Once he had received the grace of this sacrament, the child himself asked to receive Holy Communion, professing belief in the true body and blood of Christ in the Most Holy Eucharist. How do we explain this? One word, grace. Grace happened, and with grace, the virtues. In this case, the child did not have this principle of grace inside of him. As a result of this absence, he couldn't possibly have had the theological virtues that accompany grace. He simply could not believe in the Eucharist. But once the grace of baptism was given to him, he began to see. Faith was at work in his mind, allowing him to adhere to what Christ had revealed about the gift of his body and blood, that they are food and drink. Rare is it that we see grace and the virtues in such incredible contrast with their absence. They are usually rather subtle in their activity. Nevertheless, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the story of this boy proves that. It proves the power of baptism, the doorway to divine life. All natural religions have natural sacraments, signs that point to significant events, rites of passage and alteration in life. But how do these differ from the divine sacraments instituted by Christ? Natural sacraments signify natural events, but they do not affect what they signify. For example, a coming of age ceremony does not make you come of age. It simply recognizes that you have done so and celebrates it. Supernatural sacraments, on the other hand, both signify and effect supernatural realities. The seven sacraments of the Catholic Church also differ in that they are principally actions of Jesus Christ himself, rather than the individual or the community and so they do not foster and celebrate simply human growth, 
but growth in divine life. Yet they are similar in that just as the body individually and communally goes through various stages in human life, so too are we given grace, which corresponds to growth, both individually and communally in divine life. Grace is participation in divine life. The supernatural virtues grow out of grace the same way our powers of thinking and willing and expressing emotion grow out of our natural life, out of our soul. Just as we can perfect our natural powers to some degree by practice and by discipline, so too can we perfect those powers for their new participation in divine life. Unaided by the light of faith, we cannot know with the intellect that the Eucharist is the body of Christ. We cannot love God above all things and our neighbor out of love for him without the aid of charity. We cannot expect that the great and arduous struggle of life will end in beatitude, the face-to-face -face vision of God, without the virtue of hope. All of this begins with baptism. All of this begins with a new birth. Christ commanded his apostles to baptize all nations in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In speaking with Nicodemus much earlier, Christ said that we had to be born again using the Greek word anothen. But that word also means from above. When we are born, we have a nature. Indeed, the very word nature comes from the Latin word natus, meaning to have been born. But to be precise, we are born with a human nature, not a divine one. We call someone father or mother because from them we received our human nature. But then how do we call God father if we do not have his nature? In a loose sense, we are able to call him father because our human nature also comes from him as our creator. But we cannot call God father in the true sense of having received his nature, unless, of course, we are adopted. Unlike adoption in the usual sense we are familiar with, God gives to those whom he adopts grace to be true sons and daughters, to participate in his nature. What being born again and from above means ultimately is to usher us into divine life. Once we possess this divine life, we are then open to receive all of the sacraments which operate, nurture, and influence the life that we've received. This is where we have many sacraments. Each attends differently to that divine life. The nascent life received is like a newborn infant. The first Sunday after baptism, in fact, was always called Quasimodo Infantes because the new Christians, having been baptized on Easter, were like Quasimodo, little infants. For eight days, they were actually required to wear their baptismal garments and stay in the protective care of the bishop, who would further instruct them in catechesis. On the eighth day, the day of recreation, they were allowed to remove their white robes and finally go into the world. The divine life of grace at the infant stage is small and fragile, like any child's life. It needs growth and strength. This requires our cooperation. As St. Augustine once noted, God created us without us, but he will not save us without us nor will he save us as individuals, just as an infant must be cared for by his or her parents, so to the neophyte must be cared for by Holy Mother Church with instruction and sustenance, protected, guided, 
and allowed it to flourish in the growth of grace. The image of the infant highlights the personal nature of the sacrament. An infant must receive care, be able to digest food, and keep sickness at bay. This aspect of receptivity changes as he or she grows. As the child's mind develops and he asks questions about purpose, he directs himself to certain ends and chooses one good over another. He must choose to receive something. Everyone knows that outside of physical force, with violence or a threat of punishment, one cannot make a child eat spinach. You are a rational creature endowed with faculties which make you a type of lord over your own actions. This personal element of response is part of the sacraments. The sacraments are cooperative. We are cooperators with God. We must respond. Now, all sacraments have both matter and form, both of which are signs. Matter signifies something to us naturally. In other words, if I smile, it's a natural sign that I'm happy. We all have a capacity to read natural signs like this. Words which, along with certain gestures, make up the form of the sacrament. Add to the natural sign a further signification. Christ made water, and yet he will add to that water words and gestures which will signify even more than the natural meaning of water. Christ said to Nicodemus that we must be born of water and the Spirit. Water is a natural sign to which is added the words of the baptismal rite. Why water? Well, it's a natural sign of life. We need it to live. But it's often chaotic and dangerous. And so it's also a sign of death. Lastly, it's a sign of something else, purification. We need it to wash and to be cleansed. The scriptures are replete with imagery that shows how water has been symbolic in the Old Testament, pointing to its ultimate sense in the New Covenant. The first image of the Holy Spirit hovering over the waters in Genesis is a sign that waters belong to him and he will use them to give life. Later in salvation history, water would play an important role in Noah's story and the Great Flood and with Moses parting the Red Sea. These images link water with life, but they also link it with death. In this sacrament, both death and life are signified as well. St. Paul teaches that in baptism we are plunged into Christ's death. The baptism of Christ's death, for which he longed, would be shared in by those who were his followers. In this baptism, we are purified of sin. The old man in us receives a death blow, and the new man begins to live. If we have died with him, we begin to rise with him. Christ plunged himself into the waters of the Jordan as he plunged himself into the sin of man in the baptism of his crucifixion. We are submerged in his death by the washing of baptism. Thus, the material element of baptism is water, the form is taken directly from sacred scripture. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. This threefold invocation is curious. In the imparting of a new nature, we do not say, I baptize you in the name of God, nor do we say, I baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ. Baptism is administered in the Trinitarian formula because we will participate intimately in that divine personal life. These persons are one, and in them we live and move and have our new being. There are three, equal in majesty and perfect in unity. 
Each sacrament has an immediate effect and also a more remote or ultimate effect. The immediate effect is what the church calls, in this case, a character, while the ultimate effect is the cleansing of sin, incorporation into divine life, and friendship with God. But let's return to character for a moment. When we first meet someone, we quickly become cognizant of his or her character, right or wrong. Are they pleasant or grumpy? Are they shy or gregarious? Do they have a strong moral character? Or are they prone to deceit and malice? Are they generous or greedy? The word character, however, in this context is a bit different. It comes from a Greek word, meaning an engraved mark or sign. A soldier or slave, for example, was stamped or branded. Three sacraments impart to us a certain character that is irrevocable. We're branded with it, as it were. Baptism, confirmation, and holy orders. That word indelible means that it cannot be deleted. It remains with us. The word character is used in the letter to the Hebrews when speaking about the sons co-equality with the Father. The first letter to the Hebrews tells us, quote, he reflects the glory of God and bears the very stamp of his nature, upholding the universe by his word of power. Another word which is employed to describe character is seal or sfragis. God, St. Paul says, has put his seal upon us. The nature of the sacraments is somewhat transitory. They are like aqueducts, as the power of God flows through them. In the sacrament of baptism, what remains in the soul after sacramental washing and cleansing of sin is the reality of sanctifying grace and the virtues. Just as the aqueduct stands whether or not water is flowing through it, this new life remains in the soul, despite the fact that the holy water is now dried and gone and everyone has left the church building.